Good morning, church. My name is Mitchell Halstead. I'm the middle school minister here, and I'd like to thank Josh Diggs, our teaching minister, for lending me the platform this morning to talk about my favorite subject, politics. I'm just kidding. Mostly. I would like to start this message, however, with a political story from history that takes us all the way back to the year 1962 at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, the context is that the United States and the Soviet Union are in a standoff and all attention is focused on the island of Cuba and the installation of nuclear missiles within range of the U.S. homeland. Days of negotiations and political standoffs had led to a moment of confrontation at the United Nations between the U.S. Ambassador Adlai Stevenson and the Soviet Ambassador Zorin. Now, many of President Kennedy's political advisors did not have confidence that Ambassador Stevenson had the strength to forcefully present the U.S. position on Cuba before the world's stage. But Stevenson's moment of truth came on October 25th in front of the entire U.N. Assembly and recorded on television for the world to see. Here's an account of what happened in that moment. Stevenson listened impassively as the Soviet ambassador laced into the United States. When it was finally his turn to speak, he dispensed with the standard diplomatic niceties, and he instead went immediately for the jugular. I want to say to you, Mr. Zorin, that I do not have your talent for obfuscation, it's a big word, for distortion, for confusing language, and for double talk. And I must confess to you that I am glad that I do not. Stevenson went on to denounce the Soviets for lying, treating Zorin in a way that the Soviet ambassador likened to an American prosecutor browbeating a defendant. But Stevenson pressed on. All right, sir, let me ask you one simple question. Do you, Ambassador Zorin, deny that the USSR has placed missiles in Cuba? Yes or no? Don't wait for the translation. Yes or no? If you watch the footage of this, and it's, it's pretty, pretty interesting to watch, everything was quiet in the moments of Stevenson's uh, address. But as soon as he makes that statement, don't wait for the translation, the entire room erupts into a chatter of activity because nobody can believe that this ambassador has, has come out with such strength calling out the Soviet ambassador. But you know what? That moment and a few that, pre, that, that follow after it really did make an enormous difference in the efforts of the U.S. ambassador to bring peace and safety to the people of the world. Now, you may remember that, some of you, and you may remember how tense some of those moments were, but here's the thing. Ambassador Stevenson knew the stakes. He knew that he was there on behalf of President Kennedy. And even more importantly, he knew exactly what his purpose was for being in that room that day. In other words, he understood that he had been sent to represent the identity and will of the U.S. government. The U.S. government was strong, and it was looking out for the peace and safety of its people. But that was a long time ago, and we live in a very different time and context today. So let's talk about you and me for the next few minutes. And let's, let's start back at the beginning. What is the context of the times we find ourselves in right now? COVID-19, ever heard of it? I bet you have. Because of the pandemic that we have all been enduring for, for many months now, and of course worldwide even longer, we are, at a, we are in an environment of social distancing. That's the very reason that you are watching me on screen right now, rather than in person like we would have normally done. It's the reason that so many of you are working from home. It's the reason that our, our students have had to go home and begin an online learning process. And all of that has led to economic woes that have led to even more socioeconomic distancing of different groups of people within our society. Absolutely, all walks of life have been impacted by the things that we've been going through for the last few months. But it's definitely true that those who are on the poorest rung of our socioeconomic ladder are probably feeling this pinch more than those who are at the upper end. And that's just a fact. On top of that, recent protests have highlighted that enduring societal distancing still exists within different racial groups within our country. Christians, though, should recognize that all of these things 
hang in front of the background of spiritual distancing, the result of sin in the world. And this goes all the way back to the very beginning, and you can trace the after effects throughout all of history. The problem is, we live in a broken world. Creation is broken because of the consequences of sin. People are broken because of the consequences of sin. The spiritual order of things is broken because of the consequences of sin. So the question is, if this is our context, what are we supposed to do? What is the role we are supposed to play? I have to confess to you, there, there are no easy answers and there are certainly no simple fixes. But I do want to present this challenge. You, if you are a Christian, you have been sent to represent. We've got to be more specific, though. After all, every person represents something and often many things throughout the course of their life, even if unintentionally. Sometimes we represent good things poorly. Other times we might represent poor things quite well. But the good news is you do get to choose what you represent and how you represent it. But the kind of representation I'm talking about today is intentional and purposeful. So what exactly am I talking about, you might ask? Here it is. If you are a Christian, you have been sent as an ambassador of reconciliation to the world. In other words, you are tasked with helping connect people to God and to each other through the power of the gospel. We find this truth in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21, and I would like to invite a special friend of mine to read this verse for us. Hi, I am Hunter Halstead, and I will be reading 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21. So we have stopped thinking of others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God, who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us the task of reconnecting people to him. For God was in Christ, reconnecting the world to himself. No longer counting people's sins against them, he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for God when we ask, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Thank you, Hunter, for that wonderful reading. For those of you that don't know, Hunter is my son, and I'm very grateful to have shared this opportunity to speak truth to you with him. Did you, did you catch the verse? Did you hear the things that were said? This text is so rich, so many wonderful things that we could talk about if only we had time. We could talk about opposing worldviews. We could talk about the inner transformation that leads to a new creation. We could talk about how Christ has taken our place as a sacrifice for sins. There's even more. But the key thing that we're going to look at today is the idea and the role of an ambassador. An ambassador represents the identity of the sender. A U.S. ambassador is the personal representative of the U.S. president. However the U.S. president would like to be perceived by the host country, it is the job of the ambassador to reflect that president's identity. Now, to spiritualize this for a moment, I want to quote from British evangelist Rodney Smith. There are five Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the Christian. But most people will never read the first four. This is why what you do and what I do, what we say, this is why it matters. Because we are educating people on the character and identity of God. A series of sermons could be preached to help define the character and identity of God, but, but let's, let's just start at a simple place, and we'll, we'll leave it here for today. If you look at 1 John chapter 4, verses 7-10, through 10, 
They read as follows. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. God is love. So simple and yet so profound. An ambassador represents the identity of the sender. But it doesn't end there. An ambassador also represents the will of the sender. A U.S. ambassador meets with members of the host country to promote the agenda of the United States, if they're a United States ambassador. Whatever the president desires to accomplish through the U.S.'s relationship to the host country, the ambassador's job is to help make it happen. So what is God's will for his ambassadors? We can try to overcomplicate this, and, and certainly I think that there is a will for each one of us that might be unique between me and you, but I think there are some, also some things that are, that are universal we could use to describe the will of God. And we don't have to look much further than the verse that was read a few minutes ago. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, we read that God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them. You see, God wants to extend his grace to all who will receive it, for people to connect with him and with each other. Now, if a person only learned of God because of your representation of him, what would they have learned? So in your mind, ask yourself these two questions. Who would they say God is based on my representation? What would they say God wants because of my representation? Now, I hope that you didn't answer, he wants us to be nice and simply leave it at that. If Ambassador Stevenson could have said, I guess I'll be nice to the Soviet ambassador and whatever happens, happens. That would not have fulfilled his mission. Instead, he approached his mission with intentionality because he understood the purpose that he was there for and he understood what was at stake. My Christian friends, you have been sent to represent a God of love who desperately wants to reconnect or to reconcile people to himself and to each other. If you're not serious about the ministry of reconciliation, then you may be representing some of the identity of God, but you are not representing the will of God. It's easy to be nice. It is hard to make disciples. What now? I'd like to revisit the question that I asked near the beginning of this message, though I'm going to phrase it slightly differently this time. In the context of today, what are the ambassadors of Jesus Christ supposed to do? Now, maybe we could approach this by applying a simple filter to ourselves. Ask yourself this question. It's a fill-in-the-blank question. Does blank represent the identity and will of God? Now, let's fill in this blank. I'll give you at least a few examples. Does my attitude represent the identity and will of God? Does this conversation I'm having with so-and-so represent the identity and will of God? Does this tweet that I'm about to send or this social media post represent the identity and will of God? Does this harmless joke represent the identity and will of God? Does ignoring that person's plight represent the identity and will of God? Does living entirely for myself represent the identity and will of God. You can fill in the blank for yourself. I'm sure we could think of so many different things that would help us to understand where we stand in our representation of God. But if you begin to apply this filter to yourself and ask these questions, and you find that you are answering no much more often than you're answering yes, first of all, don't worry, you are not alone in that. This is something that plagues all of us, all Christians, from the oldest to the, to the newest. We are all trying to figure out how we can best represent 
Christ. You're not alone. But if that is true, it's more no's than yeses. Perhaps we should humbly approach God with repentance and ask him to transform our hearts so that we don't have to continue to misrepresent him. Christians speak for the king. We don't speak for ourselves. And it's not optional, and we can't shelve our role as an ambassador. We are always on duty. And it's not just about the words we say, it's about the lives that we live. The message we are trying to communicate to the world is this, God loves you, and so do we. To work towards a solution, we have to consider the true source of the problem. Regarding the racial tension our communities are experiencing right now, it's important for us to recognize just how deep and how far back issues of oppression and injustice extend. It goes back farther than the Jim Crow laws, farther than the Civil War, farther than the founding days of our country. It goes back beyond the Spanish Inquisition, beyond first century Palestine, beyond the Roman Empire, beyond the Hebrew slaves in Egypt. Even into the farthest reaches of the Old Testament, we find Cain and Abel, and we see that injustices have been perpetrated between people since the very, very beginning. Throughout history, too many people have failed to represent the identity and the will of God. Now, the cynic in me could argue that injustice and oppression is what we do when we are left to our own devices, and we are very good at it, unfortunately. Today's issues aren't solely political or social or racial in nature. At their core, these are spiritual problems because they concern the brokenness of mankind because of sin. And guess who should be best equipped to tackle spiritual problems and be the most motivated to do so? It is the ambassadors of Jesus Christ who practice the ministry of reconciliation. And yes, that means me, and that prob probably means you as well. I'd like to end on an encouraging note. Did you know that the U.S. ambassador living in another country is residing on U.S. soil? That's right. Ambassadors work and often live within embassies, which are considered home turf for the nation the ambassador represents. In fact, the host country has no authority over what happens within the walls of the embassy. If a fire were to break out within the grounds of the embassy, the host country would have to get permission to enter those grounds in order to help put it out. If an attack occurs against the U.S. Embassy, the U.S. government considers that attack to be against its homeland. But within an embassy, a U.S. Embassy, American citizens are granted the same protections that they would enjoy if they were physically present in the United States. A Christian is an ambassador of Christ. And we know from scriptures that our bodies are his temple. You are a walking embassy. Everywhere you go, you bring the kingdom of God with you. Do not fear our spiritual enemy because you bring the protections afforded to the citizen of the kingdom of God. My Christian friends, remember, we have been sent to represent. Now let's get out there and do the job right. Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. Now, before you shut off the broadcast, I want to remind you that on July 12th, we will be reopening for in-person worship services in our worship center. But you have to go online and reserve your seat because capacity will be limited. Church, we love you. We want good things for you. And if you need anything, please reach out to our church office and we will find ways to meet your needs. We ask you to go with God and be ambassadors for Christ. Grace and peace.